Okay, well, thank you, Shirley, for uh, introducing me. So my name is Chad Page. I actually, um, I'm originally from Arizona, from Chandler, Arizona. So I like to say that I was uh, born in the heat, and um, I, I really love the Southwest. Um, but I've spent a long time um, studying sheep, and I have now lived in Idaho, Montana, Wyoming. Uh, I've done some work in Colorado, and right now I live in Utah, and I work at Utah State University as a sheep and goat specialist. And so I teach a lot of the classes about sheep and goats and um, really love everything about wool and grazing sheep and goats um, is something near and dear to my heart. So thank you, Shirley, for inviting me today. Um, today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about parasites. Um, so it's it's already pretty hard raising sheep and goats. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the other issues that make this even harder. So we're gonna talk about two types of parasites, some of the ones that we see the most on our sheep and goats. So there are external parasites. So these are the parasites that we can find on top of the animal. And then there are internal parasites. And these are the parasites, the worms that they get. And so um, some, not all of them are worms. And we're gonna talk about the most common ones and some of them that kill our animals the most or that cause the worst health problems. And so maybe some of the ones that we see the most in the Southwest too. So one of the, one of the most common ways we find out what parasite we're working with if it's an external parasite, we can just look on top of the animal and we can pick off a tick or we can pick off uh, lice or other things. But if it's an internal parasite, one of those worms, the way we find out what kind of worm it is, is we will take fecal samples. So we'll take a small amount of poop and we will take roughly three ounces of it and we'll look at it underneath a microscope. And so this picture here, is showing a slide of some different eggs that are laid by those worms. And so this big egg is from a worm that we're gonna talk about. Uh, the scientific name is Hamonicus catortis, but the common name we're gonna talk about is the barber pole worm, and that's a pretty bad one. Uh, the other internal parasite that you see on this slide is a coccidia, and this is pretty common. A lot of us who have sheep and goats deal with coccidia, um, and we'll talk about that one too. So this is the best way to really identify what kind of parasites we're dealing with. Now, I put on here that you can take some of these fecal samples and you can send them into your state diagnostic lab. So even if you don't have a veterinarian, you can get um, a piece, some poop from that animal that you think is sick, and you can send that poop on ice uh, into your local vet diagnostic lab. You know, you may have to pay for the shipping, uh, but you can send in a small amount of poop uh, to them and they can run that. To give you an idea of the cost of that, I put up uh, these two um, tables here. So this one on the right, and can you guys see my mouse? Give a thumbs up or something if you can see my mouse. Yes. Oh, yes. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So this, this side here, this table, is for Utah State University, our diagnostic lab. This one over here, this is New Mexico State University. And I just pulled this up this afternoon. Um, so if I went under the parasite section of what the diagnostic lab can do for us. I would go down to the fecal exam and they're asking for five grams of uh, fresh poop on an ice pack to be sent and they'll charge you $26 to analyze that. Um, I'm a little bit upset because this use, we used to charge less for this and I think New Mexico probably charged less too. And so I don't know I don't know if inflation recently made these prices go up, um, but this is their current pricing 
uh, as of today when I pulled up these images. Um, but so if you had a bunch of animals you thought were sick, say you have a whole herd of goats and they're really wormy and you want to know what kind of parasites they have, what I would do to save money is I would take a bunch of uh, poop samples and I would combine them into one sample. And then I would send that sample off um, to be analyzed as one. And then they can tell you all the different kinds that there's that you're seeing across your animals instead of sending separate an, uh, samples. So if you sent set separate samples and you were just looking at three animals, that would cost you almost $75. But if you just took those three poop samples and combined them into one sample, then that would only cost you the $26, okay? If we had to call our veterinarian, instead of just taking this sample ourselves, it would cost us even a little bit more money. And so I'm always, the way I grew up in, with my grandpa, I, am, I always thought about uh, money. And so I like to try to save money where I can, okay? Sure. Yeah. Um, is there a like? Can you? Is there an over-the-counter test that you can do, like for our elders or somebody that can't, you know, send those samples in? Yeah. So we'll we'll talk about what drugs to use that are going to work on a lot of different parasites, and so you don't always need to send off a sample, but this would be the best way to find out, right? Like if a veterinarian was to do it, and you could even learn how to do this online. The problem is, is you need a, you need a microscope, right? And so uh, it, there is no like easy commercial kit that costs very little money. This is probably the cheapest way to find out, but we're going to talk later on how to just treat animals, even if we don't know what parasites they have for sure. And so surely that kind of leads me into the next part of how we try to figure out what parasites we're working with. And so there are, th there are five different areas on the sheep that we look at or the goat. Um, the first one is we can look at the back end of the animal. Uh, do they have runny uh, poop? Do they have runny uh, fecal matter? Um, are they losing body condition score? Are they looking really skinny? Um, we look at their eyes to see if they have good blood uh, flow or are they looking anemic around their eyes? We look at their nose to see if there's discharge, if they have really runny noses. That could mean that they have certain parasites. And then lastly, we also look up under their jaw. And so sometimes if they're really anemic, they'll start building um, that fluid under the jaw and they'll get a bottle jaw. And we'll look at a picture of what that looks like in just a second. Okay. So if I was to look at all these different things, here's kind of a table from a, a big um, research paper, but it kind of gives me some ideas. So if I looked at the nose of my goat or my sheep, and I saw that there was a bunch of discharge or uh, mucus coming out of his nose, I could maybe think that, oh, maybe I have nasal bot flies. So uh, bot flies are really common in our area of the country. And um, so that could be something I could think about. Now, if I looked at um, the eyes and I saw that they're really anemic, there wasn't a lot of blood, then I could start thinking about some of these other uh, worms. So uh, internal worms and things like that. So each part of the animal you can kind of see that we there's different types of parasites that affect these different areas, okay? So I'm going to now just talk about a couple common parasites that we see. So first I'll talk about external parasites, and then I'm going to talk about the internal parasites and how we treat those internal parasites too, okay? So the first parasite I wanted to talk about um, is the sheep keds. Um, in our area of the country, we also see ticks, but I what I see more often are these keds. They look like ticks, and oftentimes people will call them ticks. Um, but like ticks, they they eat on blood, they suck blood, but they're actually a little they're a little uh, wingless fly. They're just a fly with no wings. 
that suck on blood, and they spend their whole lives on our sheep. Uh, they like to burrow into the wool and stay there, and they'll live, you know, four to six months, and they'll produce um, roughly 20 larvae or 20 offspring. And sometimes we don't notice we have these animals. Um, there was a research project um, a while ago, but what it did is they actually looked on the sheep to see where these kids like to live. And what they found is that the kids don't really hang out on the back of the animal. So if you're walking up to your sheep and you're looking at the wool on the top of their back or their shoulders, you're not going to see a lot of kids. Those kids actually really like to hang out on the middle portion. So they hang out on the ribs, they hang out on the shoulder and the thighs. This is where our wool is usually the longest on our sheep and the densest. And so they like to hang out on those areas where they won't be bothered very much. If you have a lot of kids, you'll probably see them in other places, but the majority of them are going to hang out here. Uh, these kids or these little blood sucking flies, they actually, they reproduce a lot um, when it's cooler outside. So you can see on this graph here, those number of kids go up in February, March, April, May, when it's a lot cooler outside. And so they'll just hang out in this wool and then they'll grow in their populations. Um, and then they decrease when the summer months are really hot. Okay, and you can see that they increase again when it starts getting cool. Luckily for us, there are some pretty easy ways to manage uh, kids, um, but they do have an impact on us. So this is a, a pelt. So if you're selling pelts from your sheep, um, those little sites where they suck on the blood, they actually make scars on the pelt and then you can't dye them as well. And so they'll actually um, make the price of your pelts go down and they do make your animals uh, grow a little bit slower, which isn't, which isn't good either. Um, but the best way to really fix this problem is to shear our sheep. So um, if you have a really bad infestation, even though maybe it's not that time of year to shear your sheep, it may be good to go ahead and get out those uh, shears, those clippers, and go ahead and lay your sheep down and shear that wool off. Just getting that wool off of your sheep will reduce the amount of sheep keds, those parasites, by almost 75%, which is really good. And then after that, once we get all that wool off of them, um, then we can use some of our drugs. And so this is a permethrin-based poron that you can find at um, a lot of animal supply stores. What are, what are some of the more common stores there, uh, Shirley or anyone else? Ours would be IFA, the Inner Mountain Farmers, or Tractor Supply, Big R. Okay, okay. So yeah, I, IFA would definitely have this drug. Tractor Supply would have it. And so once we get that wool off, we go ahead and we use this, and we just do a pour on along the back. And this permethrin-based product is pretty effective at killing kids and lice. And so if you have lice on your sheep, you would treat it very much of the same way. Uh, the problem with lice is, is they actually, they stain the wool a lot. And so with kids, maybe your wool will still be good. Um, but with lice, sometimes they're feeding so much on blood that they may stain your uh, wool. And or it may be so bad that the wool starts falling off your animals. Um, but this, this is the best way to take care of this parasite is uh, shear them, get most of the most of the stuff off and then treat them with a permethrin based uh, pour on. And you should try to do that soon after you shear. So if you shear one day, uh, the next day is a really good day to do this pour on. And then you're kind of hitting all those parasites really fast. Okay. Um, sometimes if you buy new animals, if you go to the sale and buy new animals, maybe separate them for a time just to make sure that they don't have, um, any of these parasites. So you're not accidentally mixing them in to your good sheep. And so it's good to do a, a good check over your animals and keep them separated for a little bit, if you can. Uh, not all of us have multiple pens. I know growing up, 
we only really ever had one pen, so it was hard to keep the animals apart. Another one that, and I felt it was important to I add this slide in because last time I gave a talk, it was it's been a couple years. There were a couple uh, producers from Northern Arizona that were on the webinar, and I talked about nose bots. So what this is, it's it's a fly that they land on our sheep or our goats and they'll kind of crawl up in the nose and they'll lay their eggs. And then their eggs turned into little worms or larvae and the larvae live up in their sinus cavities and they'll live there for six to eight months. And it doesn't really hurt the animal a lot. It, I mean, they can live with it pretty well, um, but it makes their noses really runny uh, maybe they'll be really irritated. And this one producer from Arizona, uh, they were telling me that some of their sheep would get nose bots really bad and they would start coughing or sneezing a lot. And then they would get rectal prolapses. Um, unfortunately, you really can't tell if you have nose bots. So you can see that this is a sheep skull that was cut in half. You can see that these nasal bots are so far up in their cavity, you really, there's no way for you to tell if they're there unless, unless you sawed that skull in half. Uh, one place I do find these uh, larvae a lot though, is the water trough. So if you have a water trough um, and you think you have nose bots, maybe start checking around your water trough or inside the water trough. And sometimes you'll find these larvae, they've fallen out of the nose of your animal and they're at the bottom of your water trough. Um, but really our animals live pretty good with them, but they can cause problems of all the drugs that we have. There's really only one that works well for these, uh, nasal bots. And that's just giving an oral drench in the mouth of your sheep of ivermectin. Um, and so we'll talk about some of the different drugs in just a minute, but ivermectin for nasal bots is really the only one that works. And I don't know why that is, um, but it's just the only one that seems to be effective on these uh, nasal bots. Has anyone here experienced any of these or found them in their water? No, but I'm going to take a closer look now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, I sometimes I'll get pictures from people asking me what that is. And I'll, I'll say, did you find that in your water? And, and sure enough, they ends up kind of being this, uh, nasal bot. Yeah. Cause usually so, if I see the, I'm oh, sorry, if I see the, Oh no, uh, go ahead. If I see the trough full of debris, I'll usually just dump it out. But I think I'll look at it first before, you know, expect it, inspect it before dumping it. Yeah. In. Yeah. Thank and you. when I was a, when I was a kid in Arizona, we would always have so much algae growing in our water troughs that mm -hmm. it would be hard. It would be hard to even see them anyway. Um, oh, wow. but if you, yeah, if you have clean water, it can be a lot easier to see them. Okay. Um. So that that's that's great. Uh, the next, I, I have uh, a question. One, yeah, um, go ahead. As far because I did notice our sheep this past um, early spring did have runny nose, and I did treat with the Ivomec. Um, yeah. How often do you treat? Do you recommend twice a year, like early spring and maybe in the fall again, like around this time? Yeah, because when you treat with the Ivermectin, you're also treating the inside of the animal. Mm -hmm. And so if you're doing it just for nose bots, I wouldn't do it very often because like mm -hmm. I said, those, even though they have those parasites, they're not a big problem to your animals. Some of the, some of the parasites we're about to talk about are really big problems. And okay. so if we, if we're going to manage how we give dewormer and stuff, uh, we're going to do it for some of these other uh, parasites that are much bigger issue. If you have mm -hmm. nose bots, Treat for it once, maybe twice a year, but don't do all of your deworming for the nose bots because there are other there are other parasites that are much worse. Okay, okay, yeah, I just do the the regular what's recommended, but um this yeah. this season I did notice the runny nose on a few of them, but it did clear up. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I don't, and I don't know why it is that that it must be the active ingredient only works on that particular uh parasite but all the other ones like valbazen and safeguard they really don't work on the uh, nose bots for some reason yeah and this season i did switch from the 
Valbazan for the sheep. And I this this past spring, I did do the Ivomet. Okay, yeah. Yeah, did you know that that was the one that works best for nose bots? Yeah, well, I was, the vet did recommend trying that. Um, she was telling us to switch our dewormers. So this year I did go with the Ivomec. Okay, yeah, there is, uh, we'll talk about how to know when you should switch dewormers and stuff like that. But okay. a lot of the stuff with sheep and goats is actually changing right now. So a um, lot of our, a lot of our veterinarians are still learning how to handle uh, some of these parasites with sheep and goats. And if you have a veterinarian that mm -hmm. does know about sheep and goats, keep them around because okay. there aren't, there aren't very many of them. I feel like. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So the next, now we're going to start getting into some of our internal parasites. Probably the first one that we all encounter because we've all bought some lambs or something else is coccidia. And so if we go back to that one slide where it had the the, the eggs inside of the, the fecal matter, uh, coccidia is just a one cell organism. It's just a very small protozoa and it lines the small intestine of the animal and it essentially kind of gives them diarrhea. If it's really bad, sometimes they'll have bloody diarrhea, but usually the animal's able to kind of overcome it on its own. But if you have your lambs um, or goats get it really bad, it could slow down how fast they grow and then you could lose a lot of money. Um, so I, I grew up with these sheep, these black belly Barbados, and sometimes we would get it, um, but there are different ways that you can handle this. You can get um, some different types of drugs. So there's one, a decoquinate, and this one is like, you can put two pounds of de decoquinate inside of 50 pounds of salt and mix it all together. And then your animals, when they consume the salt, it'll help uh, decrease uh, the amount of coccidia. There's also something called corid and corid you would put in the water, but then you need to make sure that all the animals are drinking water. Um, but the main time to do this is really uh, before weaning and around weaning is when your lambs are most stressed um, and they're really susceptible. Your older ewes aren't going to be as susceptible to this parasite, but those young lambs um, are usually pretty susceptible. The other thing is there's a lot of birds carry coccidia. Um, so if you have a ton of doves or morning doves that are flying into your, into your barns and they're pooping all over the feed troughs, you're probably going to have a worse time with coccidia. Um, then if you didn't have that. So maybe maybe you give uh, your nephew or grandson or something a BB gun and let him do some work for you. Um, the other parasite I want to talk about is the barber pole worm. I consider this parasite for the sheep industry public enemy number one. This parasite is responsible for most of our problems in the sheep industry and it kills sheep and goats really fast. Um, last time I was in Arizona, my grandpa asked me to look at some goats he had. Someone gave him a, a nice boar goat and it wasn't getting up and he was thinking it had feet problems and things like that. Um, but when I went to go look at it, one of the first things I did is I noticed that it had this bottle jaw look. So it had that kind of swelling underneath the jaw and I popped its eyelid open and I saw that it was super white. Um, that that goat was probably suffering, even though I didn't look at the, the fecal matter, I didn't look at the poop samples at all. I'm pretty positive that goat had really bad barber pole worm um, inside of him. And so this parasite is called the barber pole worm because of this kind of red and white striation it has. And the white, the red is the blood that eats um that it's sucking okay the white is the eggs that it's laying so this worm when it fills uh the inside of our animal all it's doing is eating and reproducing and it will lay millions i mean they'll lay thousands of eggs and uh they're that's why they're so bad is they're just so prolific they drink so much blood and they and they reproduce so fast so some of the common common symptoms we'll see with these animals is like my grandpa's goat, 
I'll see the bottle jaw. I'll see really pale membr membranes, both the gums and the eyelid. They'll probably have their head down, ears floppy. They won't be with the rest of the animals. And then sometimes if it's really bad, you'll just start losing animals. Maybe the first thing you see is that uh, you lose animals real fast. Um, in the West, a lot of people say, well, we're, it's so arid where we live in the West. We don't have these problems. But sometimes a really good monsoon season will green things up just enough that sometimes that's all it takes is just a couple really good rains. And then we're dealing with parasites like everyone else. Or if you have your animals on a small pasture um, and maybe it's an irrigated pasture, it's it's pretty certain that you're probably going to have to deal with this barber pollworm at some point if you're on an irrigated pasture. OK, um, so how do we how do we handle these things? How do we manage them? How do we kill them? Because if we don't kill them, then they're going to kill our sheep and goats. OK, so what we want to use as a dewormer, the problem is, is that parasite who I said is public enemy number one. He's really fast becoming tolerant to our dewormers. And in some places in the world, they're especially in the South um, United States. So places like Tennessee, Georgia, they are, they're becoming almost no drugs work where they're at. And so it's really important that I talk about this today so that we treat the animals that are sick and we don't just treat everything because we don't want our drugs to stop working. If we use a drug, um, kind of like um, Sean or the gay. What? How do you pronounce your name? Sean Dina. Sean Sean Dean. Sean Dean. So so Sean Dean talked about her veterinarian uh, telling you to switch, and maybe because at some point there was some resistance to that, or it wasn't as effective on your operation. But what we want to do is we want to talk about some things today to slow down how that resistance comes, so that our drugs continue to work. Um, now, something about dewormers, dewormers, even if they're the very best they can be, they don't kill everything. They'll kill 98, 99% of everything. But that means there's always one to 2% of worms that will live on. And then they can start multiplying and, and building up new worms that can become resistant. Okay. So some things we want to do is do not underdose your animals. So if you only have a little bit of dewormer left and you have 10 animals, but you only have enough dewormer for four animals, don't give them less to try to treat all the animals. Give them their full dose on the animals that are the worst. Because if you give them just a little bit, then more parasites are going to live and they're going to make new babies parasites that can now resist that drug. Okay, so... If you're going to treat your animal, give them the whole dose. Don't, don't try to stretch out your drugs longer. Just give them the whole dose, okay? Um, same thing, if you have 10 sheep and five look really good and five look really bad, just treat the animals that look bad. Because if the ones that are looking good, um, we want to make sure that you know we're not exposing all of the parasites to our drugs. We always want to make sure some of the parasites never see our drugs. Okay. And then the last, uh, one of the last things is once you deworm an animal, we, once you give them some drugs, keep them where they're at for maybe a day or so. So they kind of evacuate all those parasites onto the ground before you move them to a clean pasture. So if you have a pasture that's really nice and you don't feel like there's a lot of parasite burden when they're in that pasture, um, don't deworm the animals and then stick them out there because then they'll be laying the last of those eggs on top of uh, that clean pasture, okay? Uh, there's some other things that go into this too. And so uh, one thing would be to make sure that if you don't know how heavy the animal is, then you just treat for what you think the heaviest animal in your whole flock is. It's probably better to overdose than to underdose. Underdose is, uh, is a worse thing to do, okay? Um, so there are a couple, there are different drugs that we have. So uh, ivermectin uh, is one, prohibit is one. I feel like I know a lot of goat producers that use prohibit um, or safeguard. Um, valbazin is another one. Um, so what we would do on all these drugs is we would read the label 
and then we would dose depending on what the label says for our animals. If you don't know what how much your animals weigh, and but you think your heaviest, biggest you or doe weighs, I don't know, let's say 200 pounds, even though maybe most of your animals are only 150 or 170, it's better to just give them all a dose for 200 pounds than it is to only give them for 150. Um, but these doses, okay, they have three drugs. Um, we have three families of drugs. So there's a family called benzimidazoles, okay? So the active ingredient is the same in these drugs. So we have valbazin and Safeguard. We have nicotinics, so prohibit. This drug here is a nicotinic. And then we have one called macrolytic lactones, and that's where uh, cydectin and ivermectin are. They have the same active ingredient. So if I'm on an operation and I'm using, uh, it looks like one of the people in our group is using cydectin, okay? If I was using cydectin, but then cydectin stopped working on my operation for some reason, like the worms built up resistance to cydectin, I can't switch to ivermectin, even though it's a different name, they use the same kind of active ingredient. And so if cydectin doesn't work, then that means ivermectin doesn't work. And I have to switch to something like valbazin or prohibit. Um, same thing goes with valbazin. If I, if I was using valbazin all the time and it stopped working, I can't, I can't switch to safeguard because safeguard won't work either. So I need to switch over to ivermectin or something like that. Um, it looks like a, uh, one of the questions just came in of, are there any natural remedies for various parasites? I've read uh, apple cider vinegar may help or diatomaceous earth. That's a great question. Um, there's a lot of research that actually has been done with diatomaceous earth, and they actually don't see that it works very well. But there are, there are other natural things that seem to be working better. So some plants have uh, tannins in them. So like our juniper trees that we find in through Arizona and New Mexico, uh, they have more, uh, more of these tannins. And a lot of tannins have been shown to decrease parasite burden. Um, and there's some other forages uh, that have been shown to help decrease uh, burden. But most of the parasite people who study parasites in sheep and goats, where they find is the best if they use some natural remedies is they'll use some of those forages that may be high in tannins, and then they'll use a combination of drugs with those natural remedies tend to be the best way. Um, but I have heard people say that apple cider vinegar works, but I've never seen research that that shows that it does. I know that diatomaceous earth has not been shown to really have very much effect at all, but my whole life, people have always said that it works. But now that I've worked as a scientist, um, I've read papers that talk about how it doesn't work. So that that's a great question because I know that sometimes we try to look for ways that we can help mitigate um, having to use drugs all the time um, but if you're dealing with something like this barber pole worm um, and you're not using drugs, you might be losing a lot of animals. And so uh, sometimes these drugs become really important in order to save the life of our animals. Um, the way we find out how these drugs work, though, so let me see if I can get my slides working. So we do something called, um, and thank you for that question. That was a great question. So how do we tell if our, our dewormer is still working? Um, so Sean Dean, if, you, if your veterinarian was out at your place and they were testing to see if your dewormer was still working, what they would have done is they would have identified maybe two or three animals that had worms on your operation, and they would have taken a fecal sample, and they would have counted the amount of eggs in that fecal sample and then they would have treated your animal with one of those drugs, ivermectin, uh, cydectin, uh, valbazin. And then they would wait 10 days and sometimes even up to two weeks. They would wait that amount of time. And then on those same animals that you thought were sick, they would go collect 
a fecal sample again, and then they would do that count. Now, if you saw a bunch of those, those eggs go away, that means that your drug is working, okay? So if you have like 95% uh, reduction in parasite burden um, through counting eggs, that means that there's no resistance to your dewormer. You can keep using that dewormer. Um, but if you see that, you know, there's, you still have 60% or 70, 80% of those uh, eggs are still there. It's about the same. That means that you probably have pretty severe resistance that if you're dealing with barber pull worm and there's still a bunch of eggs there, that means that they have probably built up resistance against that drug and you need to find another drug family that works. So you need to identify what works. At the farm here at Utah State University in Northern Utah, I, I did a project with my graduate students and we, count, we did this this summer with Valbazin because I was asking our veterinarian well, what works on our operation? And we actually found out that Valbazin doesn't work on our operation anymore. We, When we did this, we saw that it was only reduced it by 30%. So we have severe resistance um, against Valbazin with the barber pull worm here on our sheep and goats in Northern Utah. And so now I have to switch to a different type of dewormer, okay? The other thing that is important to know is that, and this is this is where it's very different. So if you have a good veterinarian, they may know this, but a lot of veterinarians don't, don't know what I'm about to say, is if you have a dewormer that works, keep using that dewormer and only treat the animals that are sick. Don't treat all of them. Only treat the animals that are sick. And then once that stops working, then switch to another one. And once that stops working, then switch to the last one. But what happens is, our veterinarians used to say, well, rotate through all the dewormers. Has anyone heard that before? You rotate through the dewormers so they never know what's coming? I haven't. You've never heard that? No. Oh, has anyone else heard that before? Yes. Okay, we got one yes. So that was that was a, a very common thing that they used to teach in vet school. Um, are the scientists now are saying don't do that anymore because if you're wrote if you're giving them different drugs all the time um it may seem like it's working really well but then 4 years later nothing works and when and when they stop working they all stop working at the same time and then you're left with no tools and so it's really hard to treat anything and then you're trying to look for alternatives or natural remedies on how to treat these animals. And it's it's really hard. So the thing that we teach now is that find one that works for your operation. And if it seems like it's working and you don't even have to do the fecal counts, if you feel like it's working and your animals are staying healthy, just stick with that dewormer. Once you feel like it's not working anymore, switch to a new dewormer. Um, and that's that's the way that we can let our tools last longer. Because remember, there's only three three families of drugs. That's not very much. And the cattle, cattle, horses, all these animals have much bigger industries than our sheep and goats do. And so there's not a lot of drug companies or really anyone making products for sheep and goats because there's just not enough money coming in from that. And so it's really important to try to use our tools as long as we, as long as we can. Um, I was part of a study that we did when I was living in Montana. But you can see here on this image, it has Montana, Wyoming, and then one location in Utah. And if we continue to do this study all the way down into the Four Corners regions and looked at you know, Arizona, New Mexico, we'd probably see pretty similar results. Um, but what it showed is that even though all these areas are a lot more arid than other parts of the US, if you were on uh, irrigated pasture, almost all these operations that were on irrigated pasture had worm burden. And so one thing that I like to try to tell people is the sheep and goat industry is changing. A lot of people who are, uh, their farms are getting smaller over time. And so maybe they can't have cows anymore, but they can have sheep or goats. 
And if you have a smaller farm, you're probably going to have the animals on the same ground all the time. Maybe you can't bring the animals out to range uh, different spots every day. And so if you're just confined to, you know, just one or two acres, uh, you're probably going to see more parasite burden because they're not able to go to new places all the time. Um, or maybe you'll try rotational grazing, which is becoming more popular. And so this fact that our farms are getting smaller, I think, is a good reason to think more about parasites than maybe we have before. So I, I did talk to you guys, well, don't treat every animal. And sometimes the question is, well, how do I know what animal to treat? And so there was a bunch of scientists, and they're actually from South Africa. Um, but... They did a bunch of research about the barber pole worm because that is usually the worst worm that kills sheep and goats. And what they did is they found out that looking at the eyelid is one of the best correlated things that you can look at to find out if they have bad uh, worm burden and if they're handling it poorly. And so what they did is they developed this card and it's called a Famacha card. You could probably even just Google it and maybe even refer to it on your own operation. Um, but they do some classes and things like that. And maybe uh, I think Shirley and some of you are involved in extension. This could be something that could be done in person. Um, I, I know I've been to Farmington and stuff like that. You could do a workshop, uh, how to do this and how to look at it. Um, but you, what you do is you'd pop the eyelid out kind of like this, and you would compare it to this chart. Now this here, looks kind of like in the middle a little bit. And so this would score a three on this. It's called a Famacha card, but it essentially just looks how anemic are they are, how much blood they have. And so this would score a three. And on this card, if they're starting to get more pale, it says to treat this animal if you think they need it. So if I was looking at this goat and I saw that they were a three, but they also had a runny nose, a bottle jaw, bad body condition, I would be more likely to treat this goat. But if they were a three, but a lot of my other animals were like fours and fives, maybe that's my best animal and it still has good body condition. Maybe I don't treat that animal, okay? Um, but if I have a ton that are really good looking, that have really red eye, eye membranes, um, and I have only a one or two threes, maybe I'll treat those ones with my drug, but I won't treat all of them. I'll just try to treat the ones that indicate they need. If you see it this white and that story with my grandpa's goat that someone gave him, when I looked at it, it was, it was about this white, um, super, super pale. And I, I went to the store and I bought some drugs for my grandpa and I did what I could. I gave it water and some more good feed. And unfortunately, that goat died that night. There there probably wasn't much I could do or my grandpa could do for that goat. Okay. Um, but what we want to do is make sure we always have some animals where the parasites that are living in them never see our drugs so that it works for a long time. And so when we're selecting animals, I teach people to use this system, the FAMACHA scoring system um, because it works for that parasite that's such a problem. What is nice is this works for both sheep and goats. And if any of you have alpacas or llamas, it actually works for alpacas and llamas too. Um, but this parasite really isn't a problem with cows or horses. So we don't have to worry about them uh, with this. One other thing, if you were going to write anything down that I said tonight or anything from these slides, this is what I would write down. There's a website called wormx.info, and this site is where all the scientists in the United States and all the veterinarians that work with parasites with sheep and goats, they put information on this website on how to pretty much take care of every single parasite, and it gets updated all the time. So it's new information, it's really good, it's easy to understand. And so whenever someone asks me a parasite issue, even if I think I know it, oftentimes I'll go to this website just to make sure that I'm that I'm talking about it correctly, that I see the right uh, information. And they'll even do stuff. I read a paper on there the other day that talked about uh, a tapeworm in, in sheep. 
And they showed a study in Australia where they looked at the cost of deworming and the cost of uh, loss of gain in lambs that have tapeworm. And they, they actually showed that sometimes having tapeworm um, and just letting the animal grow slower was better than treating it with drugs from a financial point of view. Now, if that's your animal and you want to help it with tapeworms, then I would say treat it. But on a really large scale, uh, they actually talked about how maybe that that wouldn't be the greatest decision financially. And so they'll they'll talk about stuff that even kind of breaks the mold on what we have normally been told, which I really appreciate. <clears throat> um, some of some of the last things I want to talk about is um, there are breed differences. So sometimes some of the things that you can do that to help is maybe maybe you have a type of breed like. So our Western, uh, like kind of white-faced Rambolets, some of our wool breeds, they don't do as well with parasites as other breeds. So some of these hair sheep breeds, like the Katahdin um, or the St. Croix um, or uh, the Navajo or, or the, the Churro, the Churro sheep is also pretty good with parasites and a very hardy animal. And so the... If you were to look at all these different uh, breed types, maybe having a breed like that works better on your operation than another breed type. And sometimes survivability is the most important things. Um, if you have a breed you really like, but you don't think they do well with parasites, uh, that's okay too. Because over time, if you choose the animals that do well with parasites, uh, that is a heritable trait. It's a lowly heritable trait, so it may take you a while uh, to get enough offspring from an animal that do better with parasites. But over time, you can choose for animals um, to do a little bit better with parasites. But it's a lot faster to deal with it if you choose one of these breeds that does really well. So the St. Croix, uh, the Katahdin, the Churro, they've all developed in areas where they learned how to there's a lot warmer areas and things like that where they can deal with parasites a little bit better. Uh, these breeds actually developed like near the equator on islands and stuff where there's even more parasites than the Southwest. So another thing that you could do is if you have cows, uh, putting in your cows with your sheep, those cows, they're generally not bothered by the same type of parasites uh, that your sheep are. And your sheep generally aren't aren't bothered by the same type of parasites that your cows have. And so if you do multi-species grazing, uh, cows and sheep or cows and goats together, that can usually help with parasites too. <clears throat> um, so kind of in summary, and then you guys can ask me all sorts of questions um, if you'd like. Uh, these external and internal parasites in sheep and goats, um, you should think about them on your operation. You should try to figure out how often you may treat them, uh, which animals you're going to treat. And then if you're dealing with external parasites, try to get shearing done. And I like to do it before lambing because then uh, you're able to get that wool off and you know that those parasites are off before your newborn lambs come. Um, another thing is <clears throat> your, your dewormer is not going to kill off everything. And so we need to make sure we use that dewormer uh, smart and that we do selective deworming so that our drugs uh, last a lot longer uh, just so we have have something that works in the future. And so I hope I hope this was informative for you guys. I uh, if anything, writing down that website wormx.info uh, should be really good uh, for you and a really good help. And so even if you can't, call someone. Um, hopefully you can just look up some information on that website. And all of that is really good, really good information. So um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, if I don't know, I'll let you know I don't know, but uh, I can always find out the question or find out the answer too. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Terrell? Yes. I'm going to go ahead and post the polls. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Do your thing. Can I ask uh, where everyone is from?
here. Are most people from New Mexico or Arizona, Southern Utah? Good evening. This is Trina. I'm from Hi, Farmington. Trina. Oh, Farmington. Yes. So it was interesting. Uh, I've always heard mixed information about um, deworming. Some said monthly. And I have heard where you mentioned your veterinarian tells you switch out your dewormers, change them out every so often. So I found it interesting tonight that we only deworm the ones that are not looking well. And it should yeah. not necessarily be a monthly um, flock health. No, no. I know that. Um, I know that sometimes the show industry, so if you have like show goats or sheep, sometimes they treat their animals a lot. <laughs> and I they I don't know why they do that. Um, but yeah, I would say only treat those animals um, when they need it. If they don't need it, if your animals never need to be dewormed and you can save all that money from not buying drugs, all the better, right? And so... If you just had really healthy animals and you're like, man, I never feel like my animals are suffering from worms um, and you want to double check yourself, maybe send off a fecal sample. And if they if it comes back that there's no eggs in that fecal sample, then, you know, I don't I don't think you need to use it. Um, but if. If you do have animals that are sick and say you have 20 sheep, but you have the same two that are always getting sick. Um, I would treat them when they need it. And maybe they do need it monthly. Maybe you treat them monthly, but you don't have to treat everyone else uh, monthly. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a little different than kind of, and even our veterinarians that work with me at the college, uh, some of them still think that you should rotate through. Um, but it's been pretty clear now across the industry, the whole United States is switching over to this aspect of just use one drug, until it stops working and then don't use it, it or and then switch to one that does work and then that will by the time you get through all the drugs hopefully you can go back to that original one that worked and now it hopefully is has works again on your operation because by then you've probably bought some new animals or you have younger ones that have never seen the drug before um and all these different things and so uh, the new consensus is that work with one that works and as soon as it does switch to the next one and hopefully years down the line once none of them work then switch back to the original so um it looks like some questions are coming in or trina were you going to say something yeah sorry i'm um, going back to that pour on for kids do you would I still be defeating the purpose of avoiding kids if I did that and made that an annual um uh, process? Yeah, so my that walk? that one that Energy. one there really isn't those kids aren't really building up resistance. So it's mainly that barber pole worm that's building up resistance. So if you shear your sheep and you pour on permethrin every year. Um, that's still great management. I would say yes, continue to do that. If you want to do that pour on every year, or if you're getting lice on your goats or whatever, just treat everyone. Yes. That's that's a great question. That's a little little confusing when we're talking about internal parasites and then we're talking about those external parasites like keds or lice and stuff like that. Um, does that make sense, Trina? Yes, that that explains it. Thank you so much. Okay, awesome. Um, there was some questions that uh, says, uh, are grazing personal recommend a dewormer all the herd every year, twice a year? Um, I think that's kind of like a rule of thumb people do, but um, I don't I don't think you necessarily have to do that, especially um if you don't have any worm problem i i grew up in a little single wide trailer and if we could save money we would um if you think that that is the best way to and, and another thing is i'm not telling you guys what what to do like if you want to do something another way talk to your veterinarian 
Um, but this is just what all the research is showing us right now. Um, so I think a rule of thumb is people say, oh, I'll, I'll treat at this time and this time. And they usually do that as they're going out to range or coming back in. Um, but uh, I think that if you're out on range, um, only treat if you really need to. So um, the another question is, is ivermectin safe for nursing use? This is where I would have to say, and I don't remember off the top of my head, I know there are some uh some different things on the tag about this. So each dewormer is going to have its own cautions. And so that's where I'd say you have to read the tag and look at what the limitations are for that um, dewormer. So some dewormers or even some antibiotics, if you give it to the animal, um, you're going to have to wait a certain amount of time before that animal is slaughtered for food. And so I think that kind of goes into the same category as uh, ivermectin safe for nursing use. And I can I can look that up in a little bit. And so if Kim, you want to send me your email, I'd be happy to just look that up and and send it to you real quick. Um, that would take me almost no time at all after this uh, meeting. And then uh, looks like we have a couple more. Uh, Ganado, Arizona, uh, Navajo Nation, Red Valley. So I, Shirley, I really appreciate you inviting me out. We did a extension program with uh, Regan Weiselusi from uh, Landing, Utah, down at Monument Valley. And I think we probably had 50 people show up. It was one of the best extension meetings I've ever done. And so I appreciate everyone getting on here and asking really good questions and people who are just really uh, in love with their sheep and and trying to do the best for their sheep and goats. So thank you very much. And then Kim, I'll write down your email and I'll send you an email right after this. I have a question. Um, these yeah. slides, the slideshow that you presented, are they available to print so I could refer back to like my records or anything if I need that website or just yeah. something to refer to? Yeah. Uh, Shirley, do you want me to send you like a PDF of these slides or? We would greatly appreciate that. I just sent you an email saying that if it would be okay for you to share that with our website, the NSA website, so we can post okay. it for our producers. Okay, yeah, I, I can do that. I can share that. And then I know there's a couple other universities who put out some uh, good stuff on how to treat for parasites too. And so I can also send those and those have a little bit more text. They're a little bit more descriptive. And so that should uh, be probably easier to read than some of the slides because some of the slides, I don't put all the information. I just kind of talk about it. So I'll try to do that. We would appreciate it. Okay. Sh Shirley, can I ask, did I meet you at the Lambing School in Cedar City? No, you no, I didn't go. Oh, okay. It was probably Mikel. Okay, yeah, we had now. we had a ton of people not from north, uh, from New Mexico, but Denae College, I think, sent like six or eight people. Um, so it looks like we have some more comments. Um. Uh about where to find the slides. And then uh, the other one from Trina on some past research with the dewormer to avoid is valbazin um, for pregnant lactating sheep and goats. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I would have to double check. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I know that there is one of them that there are issues with uh, pregnant animals and I don't remember, but uh, Trina may be right. So thanks, Trina. Okay, well, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to call me or even text me, and I would be happy to answer any questions, or uh, surely if you ever want to reach out to me and get more information, I'd be uh, really happy to, to work with any of you. Um, I just, the more I can get farther south in Utah, the better. Uh, I, I think I love the desert at heart, so uh, any chance to get back is good for me, so. Thank you so much. 
Yeah, thank you. A lot of good information. Thank you. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Terrell Yazi, and I'm going to uh, show share upcoming to, events. Do you want me to stop my share so you can? Okay, thank you. Yeah, let's see if I can. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Shirley, can you allow me to share my screen? I'm not a host. Oh. Okay. And upcoming next week on Thursday, October 17th. Um, if this will, okay, there we go. October 17th, we have an in person workshop. It's happening at Nashchidi Chapter House from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, Carol Palmer is going to be the presenter. She's a Coke food specialist. Uh, you can head to our website at nsa.newmexicostateuniversity.edu to sign up or use the uh, thumbnail to uh, log on. And then the following week, October 23rd, which is on a Wednesday, we're going to have another webinar at our usual time, 5.30 to 6.30. This one was with Jeff Anderson, a Donia County Horticulture Extension agent. Again, head to our website to um, sign up. And uh, in November, so this one's uh, next month, uh, we have a fruit tree disease and disorders for northern New Mexico. It's going to be a webinar, and it's going to be from 5.30 to 6.30. It's going to be hosted by Philip Lujan. He's a PhD extension plant pathologist. Um, so that's the upcoming event, and it's going to be very interesting. Uh, so we just want to reiterate our project, our Navajo Sustainable Agriculture. Our main goal is to provide technical assistance for ranchers and farmers and to create their conservation plans and uh, also host these educational meetings and workshops. So we just want to thank you for attending. And we also work in partner with New Mexico State, USDA, uh, Diné College, and COPE. And we just want to thank everybody again for attending and thank Chad for his time and his expertise and uh, on behalf of myself to Shirley and our team and Mikel and we thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. So what we do as NSA project is we are the also the New Mexico Cooperative Extension Service. We we deliver and collaborate with the Nick College Land Grant Office, Community Outreach and Patient Empowerment, which is COPE. And then we are funded by the USDA doing outreach and assistance for social disadvantage for, for farmers and ranchers. So the Navajo Sustainable Agriculture Project improves the operation, profitability, and sustainability of social disadvantaged Navajo farmers and ranchers, along with veteran farmers and ranchers. Increase Navajo, the knowledge of the veteran farmers and ranchers, along with farmers and ranchers, and use of the USDA funding. We educate our producers with um, NRCS, FSA, RMA programs, and also other services like the Navajo Nation AIF programs, any funding that's available for our producers. We also <clears throat> increase the local production and consumption of, of fresh fruits and vegetable and healthy food by the Navajo families and individuals. 